Welcome to Approach to ABGs Part 3. My name is Jason Wechter. In this presentation, we're going to cover the anion gap. Anions are negatively charged ions. Cations are positively charged ions. And I am positive that you are not charged. Therefore, your cations equals the number of your anions, and you are electrically neutral. Logically, if we created the math equation cations minus anions, we would expect that the answer would be zero. However, this equation is not actually true, and let's see if we can understand why. In fact, when we calculate the number of cations minus the number of anions, the value is around 12. Because the value is not zero, it appears that we don't have enough anions to make us electrically neutral, and that's why this is called the anion gap. The cations we are measuring include sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. The anions that we measure are chloride, bicarb, and phosphate. We choose these ones to measure because they are present in the largest quantities. And in fact, we tend to ignore magnesium, calcium, and phosphate because the values for these ions are usually around 1. And since I'm lazy, and most other people are lazy, we're just going to ignore them in the equations. The anion gap equation is cations minus anions, which is sodium plus potassium minus chloride plus bicarb. And using these numbers, we can see that the anion gap comes out to about 16. We can further simplify this equation by removing potassium, as potassium is usually close to a value of 4, we can reduce the anion gap from 16 down to 12. So if we are including all of the cations and all of the anions, where are the missing negative charges? And the answer is they're not actually ions, they are larger molecules, specifically albumin. A normal albumin level is 40 grams per liter. And Albumin has a quarter charge for each gram per liter. So it has about a minus 10 charge when the albumin levels are normal. If we hypothetically add albumin into the anion gap equation, remember that albumin has a quarter negative charge, so we need to divide by 4. And when we crunch all the numbers, the anion gap comes out to close to zero, in this case, two. Remember that there are many anions that are not included in this equation, and so the answer is not likely to come out to an exactly zero answer. What happens if the albumin levels are low? What impact would this have on the anion gap? Well, the value of 10 would be reduced, and since the equation still needs to have a net positive charge of zero, an adjustment somewhere else needs to occur. Let's say sodium is the one to make the adjustment, and the sodium would go down by the same amount that the value of 10 goes down. Remember that the true anion gap equation does not incorporate the value for albumin, and so we would be expecting a value of 12. But if the albumin levels were low and the sodium adjusted accordingly, then we would expect the value of the anion gap of 12 to also go down because the value of sodium was down. Therefore, when albumin levels are low, the anion gap will falsely calculate a lower value. And to correct for a low albumin, we should add 0 0.25 for every drop of 1 that we measure in the albumin. For example, an albumin of 28 represents a drop of 12, and therefore we would add 3 to the anion gap. So is the anion gap important? 
And the answer is yes, it's very important. This is because sometimes your body makes other acids or you ingest other acids. And we don't necessarily measure these acids right away. And therefore, an increased anion gap is a very important diagnostic clue that other acids are present in the body. These extra acids cause a metabolic acidosis. And therefore, a metabolic acidosis can be of two types, anion gap metabolic acidosis and non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And different etiologies or differential diagnoses will cause a gap versus a non-gap acidosis. One super important rule is that if the anion gap is increased, then there is always a metabolic acidosis present. The major difference between a gap acidosis and a non-gap acidosis is that with a gap acidosis, a new acid is present somewhere in the body. This new acid is not part of the anion gap equation, and therefore what happens is that the bicarb goes down, but everything else stays the same. Let's see if we can understand why this happens. We're going to use the example of a lactic acidosis. This is probably the most common cause of an anion gap acidosis. And when lactic acid is introduced into the body, it will directly contribute hydrogen ions. Therefore, the hydrogen ion concentration in this equation will go up. This will shift the equation to the right and will drop the bicarb. With an anion gap acidosis, we have a new negatively charged acid. Remember that when the acid donates the hydrogen ion, it will be left with a negative charge. The bicarb buffers the new acid. And so the new acid level goes up and the bicarb level goes down. When we calculate the anion gap, we have to make the new acid disappear because it's not actually part of the equation. Nothing else in the equation changes. Sodium, potassium, and chloride all remain the same. And since only the bicarb is reduced, the anion gap will go up. So with an anion gap acidosis, only the bicarb is reduced, and this is why the gap increases. With a non-anion gap acidosis, there is no new acid. When the bicarb drops, electrically these negative charges need to balance out, and the chloride is increased. So there are two changes that occur. The sodium and the potassium don't really change very much. And since the bicarb and the chloride balance each other out, the anion gap does not go up. So a non-anion gap acidosis also increases the chloride ions and is therefore sometimes called a hyperchloremic acidosis. We will cover differential diagnoses of different acid-base disturbances in another presentation, but for now, wanted to just explain what gives you a non-anion gap acidosis if you're not generating new acid. Well, if you administer normal saline by IV, which contains chloride, it has a pH of 5.5, and this is a common cause of a non-gap metabolic acidosis. Also, if you lose bicarb out of your body through the GI tract with diarrhea or through renal losses with a condition called renal tubular acidosis, you can just simply lose bicarb. And in these cases, the chloride and the bicarb are going to balance each other out so that the sum of chloride and bicarb remains the same. So there's no increase in the anion gap. Remember, there's no new acid being introduced when you have a non 
anion gap acidosis. And typically, a non-anion gap acidosis is not as bad or as dangerous as a gap acidosis. This is the end of the anion gap presentation, and there's only one more presentation to go. And after you finish all of these presentations, you are strongly encouraged to practice your arterial blood gas interpretation skills.